this uh, topic will cover the pulse oximeter and pulse cooximeter. In this slide, we see two commercial uh, pulse cooximeter and also a pulse oximeter made by Massimo, which is one of the famous pulse oximeter uh, manufacturer, commercial ones. So uh, in this lecture, we will have three parts. In the, cover, in the first part, we will have a general background. In the second part, we will talk about the principle uh, of oximeter in the first and second generation. And finally, in the third part, we will talk about uh, the third generation, or what is, uh, which is known as a pulse cooximeter. So now we will start with a general background. In a general background, we will cover these topics. An introduction, respiratory gases in atmosphere, uh, the lung gas exchange happened at the alveoli level. Uh, then we will talk about the tissue perfusion, and finally we will talk about the respiratory gas measurement. The introduction and introduction will cover two points, or we'll have a small background about two points: the laboratory cooximeter and uh, which is uh, a laboratory device, and the pulse oximeter, which is a topic of uh, this lecture. Uh, the laboratory co cooximeter is a clinical laboratory device. Uh, it measures uh, the different forms uh, of the hemoglobin uh, or uh, the different derivatives of the hemoglobin. We have the oxyhemoglobin and the deoxyhemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, and metahemoglobin. So the four types of the hemoglobin or the four derivatives of the hemoglobin in our red blood cells and we finally uh, we can have after much measure, measure these four types of the hemoglobin we can have uh, the total hemoglobin the principle of this lab machine or lab cooximeter we will have a hemolyzed uh, blood sample whole, uh, whole uh, hemolyzed whole blood sample uh, we pass uh, a light through it and we measure the absorbedness at different wavelengths to measure the different uh, hemoglobin derivatives. Here we can see some uh, major manufacturers of the lab uh, cooximeters. Uh, this is an image of a commercial lab cooximeter. Now we will start talk about the pulse oximeter, which is a uh, non-invasive alternative or replacement for the lab uh, cooximeter, which invasive one, which we need a blood sample. So uh, the pulse oximeter is a non-invasive uh, device uh, measuring the oxygen or monitor the oxygen saturation of arterial hemoglobin by measuring the light absorbedness changes resulting from the arterial blood flow pulsations. This means, for example, as we see in this slide, uh, how the blood pressure changes uh, in the uh, systematic uh, circulation. We see that in the arterioles and arteries and left ventricles, we have what we know is uh, pulsations, which is an AC signals. When we reach the capillaries, uh, and even before the capillaries, we will start to have only the mean pressure without pulsation. Uh, so in the pulse oximeter, what we really measure is this pulsation, pulsation in the uh, arterial side. So uh, here we can see uh, major manufacturers for the pulse oximeter and pulse cooximeters. Uh, like uh, Criticare, GA Healthcare, Massimo, Covidian, Nihon Kohoden, and so on. Pulse oximeters can be classified in different ways. One of them is the classification according to the wavelengths. So we can have uh, the pulse oximeter which uses two wavelengths which is known as a first and second generation also we have uh, the pulse oximeter which have uh, more than two wavelengths like eight wavelengths uh, eight wavelengths uh, example like uh, the pulse oximeter made by massimo so one of the classification is the classification of this pulse oximeter and cooximeter according to the uh, uh, number of the wavelengths used to measure the uh, uh, oxygen saturation so as we said we have a dual wavelengths in the first and second generation and we have uh, multiple wavelengths uh, in the third generation an example will be the one uh, pulse oximeter uh, manufactured by massimo it uses eight wavelengths another classification of the pulse oximeters 
uh, is according to the position of the source and detector in the pre, uh, in the probe. Uh, we have two types. We have uh, the reflected type and we have the transmitted type. So in the reflected type, both the LEDs, the red and infrared, or uh, other wavelengths, uh, and the phototransistor, which is the detector, are both in the same time. So we have the uh, LED sources and the detector in the same time. We call this type as reflected. Uh, and uh, we have the transmitted type where the source and the detectors, uh, sorry, so sources and detector. So we have, like, as we said, uh, two LEDs or many LEDs, uh, depends if it's a pulse or pulse oximeters. And the detector are opposite, opposite to each other. So they are facing uh, each other. This type is the mostly used uh, commercially. Uh, the application also can be used for the classification of the pulse oximeter or pulse co-oximeter. Uh, we can have uh, a standalone pulse oximeter, or it can be part of the patient monitor or a vital sign monitor. Uh, it can be, uh, which is, we use it for recording uh, for patients. So in patient monitor, we have uh, a pulse oximeter, we have uh, an electrocardiogram, invasive blood pressure, non-invasive blood pressure, temperature, and so on. So we're measuring the, uh, the SpO2 or the blood oxygen saturation uh, with other parameters. This is available in the patient monitor, also in the uh, vital sign. Uh, also, we can uh, have uh, pulse oximeter as a halter system. Uh, the halter system uh, is used to recording the uh, pulse, uh, uh, the pulse saturation or the oxygen saturation for a long period, like uh, for for around the 24 hours or even more, like one day or two days or three days depends. Uh, we have also a pulse oximeter uh, is used uh, as optional in a defibrillator. Uh, another application for the pulse oximeter in a what's called a polysomnographic device or in polysomnography, which is used uh, for in sleep laboratories, in addition to many sensors, including the EEG, EMG, uh, ECG, and other uh, parameters. Uh, now we will have uh, some photos for the commercial pulse oximeter and aspo 2 sensors photos. Uh, we have uh, in this slide uh, pulse oximeters uh, made by Nelcor. In the second slide, we have a pulse oximeter. All these uh, pulse oximeters are standalone. As we said, it can be a standalone or uh, an patient monitor or vital sign, but these are uh, standalone devices. This may, this uh, pulse oximeters are made by Massimo. Uh, in this image, we see two also uh, two uh, pulse uh, oximeters, a pulse co-oximeter, which uses, as we said before, eight wavelengths, and we have a pulse oximeter, which only uses two wavelengths, one for the red and another one for the uh, uh, for, uh, one for the red and another for the infrared. As we said before, we uh, can classify the pay, uh, the pulse oximeter depends on how many wavelengths we are used. Uh, we have now some images for uh, reusable and disposable uh, pulse uh, uh, SPO2 sensors. We have the transmitted type disposable one, which means uh, it's used only single one, uh, single time. So single time, and we dispose it. Uh, this one is a disposable transmitted uh, SPO2 sensor used in the finger. Another, we can see here another one which used in the foot. It's uh, for an infant or a neonate. Uh, we have other type like this one, which is uh, transmitted uh, transmitted type also, but reusable one. It's a soft type. Uh, in this uh, slide, we see different types also of uh, SPO2 sensors made by Massimo. Some of them are disposable, as we see, and some of them are reusable. In this, in this slide, we see uh, two types of the uh, of uh, SPO2 sensors. Uh, reusable and disposable, also transmitted and reflected type, which is, uh, and the, as we said before, the transmitted, we have the LEDs and the source are uh, facing each other, whereas in the reflected one, both the source and the detectors, uh, the sources and detectors are on the same side. Uh, this is an application of for the reflected uh, SPO2 sensor. 
to measure the blood oxygen saturation. Also, we see in this another reforms with the different sites like here in the ear or in the forehead and so on. Uh, now we will start talk about the respiratory gases in the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, we will focus mainly about uh, what most important respiratory gases for us will be the oxygen and CO2, which is uh, the, uh, the oxygen is uh, absorbed by our uh, capillaries in the lungs, uh, and CO2 is removed in the lungs through the uh, alveoli uh, or alveolar sacs. Okay. Uh, this is an uh, example of the molecules available in the atmospheric gases. We have the nitrogen, which uh, is a major uh, molecule available in the atmospheric gas. Uh, it's around 78%. Then comes the oxygen, which is around 21%. And the rest of the gases will be around 1%. The, also in this uh, image, we see that uh, the partial pressures and the total pressure of uh, the atmospheric pressure which is the 760 millimeter molecule. This is a dry air at a sea level. Now we will talk about the lung gas exchange happening at the alveolar sac. As we see in this, uh, here's a human gas exchange process. So uh, the process starts at the lungs. Uh, the oxygen is entered the lungs, then uh, oxygenated blood is transferred through the heart or the cardiovascular system to the rest of the organs. Then the uh, deoxygenated blood here will be uh, also transferred through the cardiovascular system to the uh, lung where we get removed of uh, the CO2. This another uh, photo shows the same, the gases journey in uh, our body. So we have uh, air inhalation and exhalation. Uh, we, uh, the air will enter our uh, airways. Uh, the air will be humidified. Then the gas exchange will happen at the alveoli level. Then transported by the cardiovascular system into the tissues where we have what we call known as a tissue perfusion. Uh, each element in this uh, journey will have an impact in the reading of the pulse oximeter or be, could be a source of error for the pulse oximeter. So we should understand this cycle in, in order to understand the, understand the design and uh, to eliminate the errors in the reading. Uh, this gas respiratory shows the gas exchange happening uh, during the inhalation and exhalation of the air. Uh, so first, the atmospheric pressure will be humidified. Uh, at the alveolar level, will, we have the gas exchange where we have will be uh, the CO2 will be removed uh, more, uh, and uh, oxygen will enter our bloodstream. Uh, then uh, the uh, gas will be expired. Uh, as we can see. Uh, that CO2, uh, that uh, N2 is a major percent, as we said before, it's around 78%, the oxygen 20%, uh, 21%, uh, the CO2 around 0.04%, and the H2O vapor, which is available in the atmosphere, is around 0.5%. Uh, in the humidified air, during the passing of the air, as we said before, in our uh, uh, air ducts, it will be humidified. So the, the, the partial pressure and the percentage of these uh, gases will change. For example, uh, the nitrogen will drop to 74%. The oxygen will also have a slight drop, uh, whereas the CO2 will stay the same. And uh, the uh, uh, the water vapor will increase from 0.5% to reach 6.2, which is a uh, uh, high percentage by comparison to the uh, atmospheric pressure. At the alveoli, also this uh, per percentage of uh, gases will uh, be different. Uh, the nitrogen will be the same or increase slightly. Uh, the oxygen will uh, drop from 90% uh, or 20% to around 13.5%. The CO2 will increase from 0.04 to 5.3%, while uh, the H2O will stay the remain. So we can say that the nitrogen and H2O will stay the same, only we will have uh, a uh, change in the oxygen and CO2. Uh, similarly, uh, we can talk about the expired gas. 
Now, uh, as we said before, we talk about the uh, gas exchange in the lungs at the alveoli level. So the oxygen will enter our bloodstream and the CO2 will be removed. So how this uh, then this oxygen will be transported, as we said before, through the cardiovascular system into the rest of the tissue and the CO2 will be removed. Uh, we can think of this uh, movement of oxygen uh, for the, during the gas exchange in the uh, alveoli uh, as a three chambers model. First of all, as we said, the oxygen will be rich in the alveoli. Uh, we will have uh, alveolar sac rich in oxygen. We will have exchange with the capillary, which contains uh, the blood. So the oxygen will pass through the alveoli to the, uh, to the second chamber, from the first chamber, which is the alveoli, to the, uh, to the plasma of uh, the blood, the plasma. Then, after being saturated, the plasma, the oxygen will be, tra will be transferred or moved into the uh, third chamber, which is the uh, hemoglobin available in the, uh, available in the uh, red blood cells. So, the oxygen will pass from the first chamber, oliveuli, to the plasma of the blood. Then, it will be uh, entered into the RBC. So, in order to have uh, saturation in the red blood cell, we have, first of all, a saturation in the plasma. And we can see the impact of this in the diagram. Uh, also, in this diagram, we see uh, the percentage of the uh, blood pressure, uh, the percentage of the oxygen saturation uh, in the plasma, also in the RBC. So, in plasma will be 1 to around 2%. Uh, well as in the in the in the RBC will be around 98 to 99 percent. So uh, the oxygen is it transferred or carried to the rest of uh, uh, organs or tissues through uh, two forms in the blood, one through the plasma and another one through the hemoglobin in the RBC. Okay. Uh, another point we should uh, talk about uh, that. Uh, when we have a CO2 uh, with uh, a water, we will have uh, an acidic form. So uh, by removing the CO2 from our blood and uh, replace it with oxygen, we, are, uh, we, uh, we uh, preserve the pH of our blood. So, uh, so this is an important to have uh, a neutral pH in our blood, not the acidic. So if, uh, we, if the removal of CO2 uh, will be... Uh, not if efficient or not uh, sufficient, we will have an increase in the pH. As we said before, the oxygen is transferred either in the plasma form or dissolved will be uh, dissolved oxygen in the plasma or will be attached to the hemoglobin molecules in RBC. Uh, so, what is the hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is a protein that has four heme groups or four iron groups. Each one uh, uh, will carry one oxygen molecule. Uh, so thus, if a hemoglobin, which has a four hemoglobins, have a four uh, oxygen molecules, uh, we say it's a saturated or oxygen oxy hemoglobin or oxygenated hemoglobin. Uh, if uh, only a par part of these uh, four uh, molecules yeah, for example, three or two or one of them is attached to the, uh, the hemoglobin, and we call this uh, type of hemoglobin as a partially saturated or reduced hemoglobin. The hemoglobin, as we said, it's a protein iron complex, transport oxygen to the peripheral tissues, remove a limited amount of the carbon dioxide from the peripheral tissues, which uh, helps in uh, play a role in controlling the pH of our blood. This is an example uh, or a slide shows the binding site of uh, uh, hem uh, hemoglobin with the oxygen. We can see in this slide uh, the formation of uh, oxy and oxygenated hemoglobin. Uh, as we see in this slide, uh, the hemoglobin and RBC. We can see that, as we said, the, uh, we have a high concentration of oxygen in the lungs, which will be uh, transferred through the blood to the tissues where we have a low percentage of oxygen. Uh, 
or low pressure oxygen, uh, low partial pressure of oxygen. So uh, as we said, the majority of the oxygen is transferred through the RBC. Each RBC, for example, could, uh, contains around 270 million of hemoglobin mole molecules, which means by a simple calculation, we said each, mo each hemoglobin have four hemi uh, groups, uh, homi, uh, homi groups yet. So it carries four uh, mo molecules of oxygen. So by the multiplication of four by 270 million, this means each RBC can carry around one billion of oxygen molecules, okay? This uh, also we can uh, increase our uh, calculation by the imagining the number of the RBCs in our blood and we multiply and we can uh, have uh, an, uh, a rough or uh, an estimation of how much or the number of uh, oxygen molecules carried by our blood in milliliters. Second, uh, the fourth part will be talk about tissue perfusion. So in the first part, we have uh, like uh, talk about the pulse, uh, the laboratory uh, co-oximeter and how it's replaced by the pulse oximeter, which is a non-invasive. Uh, then we talk about the respiratory gases available in the, uh, in the atmosphere. Then we talk about the exchange of uh, gases in the lungs at the alveoli level. Uh, we mean that the supply of oxygen and removal of CO2 uh, from our blood. Uh, then now we will talk about what's known as a tissue perfusion. We said that uh, the cardiovascular system will uh, transport the oxygen to the tissue and will remove uh, the uh, CO2. This is known as a tissue perfusion. Tissue perfusion is simply a continuous supply of oxygenated blood to every cell in the body. Uh, this happened at the capillary. Uh, we can, uh, each capillary will have uh, a length around one millimeter. It has a diameter of eight micrometers, which allow the passing of RBCs one by one. Uh, thus, uh, the thickness of the wall of the capillary is around one micrometers. Uh, in average, in our body, we have around uh, 80 uh, kilometers, which causes a high resistance and thus a slow flow of blood uh, this aim to enable the exchange with the surrounding tissue. Okay. Uh, this, uh, the process, uh, two processes dominate at the uh, capillary level. The first one is a filtration and the second one is a osmosis. Filtration is uh, by a hydrostatic pressure as a result of the pumping, uh, heart, uh, the heart pumping activity leading to interstitial fluid movement from the capillary into the adjacent tissue. Uh, and we will see that later uh, in the slide. Uh, we have also another process, which is osmosis. Uh, osmosis. osmosis is the diffusion of molecules, so a semi-permeable membrane, from one place of higher concentration to a place of lower concentration until equilibrium is achieved through this, this uh, semi-permeable membrane. So as we said, we have uh, this as an image of a capillary surrounded by a tissue. In the first half of the capillary, we will have a flow from inside the capillary to the, to, to the tissue, so, so thus from the blood to the tissue. In the second half of the Capillary, we have a flow, uh, fluid flow from uh, the tissue into the capillary or into the blood. The first half, uh, the, uh, the flow will contain water, glucose, and amino acids and oxygen. Uh, so thus, oxygen, nutrients, and water. In the second half, the tissue, uh, uh, the part of the flow uh, of the, the fluid flow from the uh, tissue to the capillary will contain water, metabolic waste, and carbon dioxide. So simply, we can say that the perfusion is essential to have a healthy tissue, to provide it with oxygen, water, and glucose, and at the same time, the removal of the metabolic waste and carbon dioxide and water. Thus, a perfusion is essential to have a healthy tissue and healthy person. This, is a part, uh, this slide demonstrates the same 
as uh, the previous one but here we will talk about the pressure how this flow is controlled through a uh, pressure so in order to have a flow we should have a difference in pressure uh, the surrounding tissue have a constant pressure, osmotic pressure, around uh, 22 millimercury, whereas the blood, uh, the pressure, uh, blood pressure inside the capillary will start uh, around 32 millimeter mercury at the arterial side. This will result, as we said before, to a flow from the blood to the surrounding tissue around uh, will be 10 millimeter mercury uh, in the first part. Where in the second part of the capillary, the, this will be uh, opposite. This means that uh, the automatic pressure will be around 22 and the blood pressure will drop to 50 millimeter. This will result in a flow from the tissue to the capillary uh, like around 7 millimeter mercury. This is known as the filtration in the first part of the capillary and the second part known as reabsorption in the second part of the capillary here we see as uh, different or special types of perfusion uh, most organs or most uh, tissues in our body uh, the perfusion uh, will be the same as in the previous two slides whereas in uh, special organs we have a special type of perfusion for example in the lungs as we said usually the the blood will supply the tissue with oxygen and remove CO2, whereas in the lungs, uh, this perfusion will be the opposite. The, this means that the uh, lungs will supply the blood with oxygen and will remove the CO2. Another example, example uh, in the uh, small intestine or the gastrointestinal tract, where the three nutrients will be uh, supplied from the small intestine to the blood capillaries and the uh, will be moved from the, uh, from the small intestine into the uh, blood and not the opposite. Finally, now we will talk about the respiratory gas measurement. Arterial blood gases uh, as an excellent or uh, excellent diagnostic tool, uh, impractical in the pre-hospital settings. Uh, what we measure in this uh, to, uh, this diagnostic tool is the pH, and we know uh, that CO2 is the, the is which uh, is really impact, uh, which has a great impact on the pH, because as we said before, when we have a water like the the water content in the blood with CO2 will have an acidic form, so the removal of that CO2 and supply oxygen will will uh, will help in the controlling of our pH between this range like 7.35 and 7.45 uh, the partial pressure of oxygen which is available in the plasma as we said we have oxygen existed in our blood in two forms in the plasma and the rbc so we talk about this part in the plasma will be between 80 to 100 millimeter mercury the pressure of co2 also in the plasma will be 35 to 45 millimeter mercury we are now we are talk about a normal, a normal person normal adult person with these percentages and the, the oxygen saturation in the rbc will be greater than 95 percent this in the plasma all this in the plasma and this part in the rbc itself this is measure this is called an arterial blood gases uh, it may can uh, in order to measure this arterial blood gases uh, the golden standard is the, to take a blood sample so it's uh, ex uh, invasive uh, expensive painful and difficult uh, the um, machines which are used to measure this blood uh, arterial blood gases uh, is a lab oximeter which we have uh, talked before uh, in the previous slide and another type is a blood uh, gas analyzer uh, and both we need to take a blood sample and uh, we measure uh, invasively the oxygen saturation the ph uh, the partial pressure of uh, oxygen in the plasma the partial pressure of the co2 in plasma as well as the uh, oxygen saturation in the rbc uh, a replacement of this will be through the use of a pulse oximeter or it helps as uh, first uh, like screening the pulse oximeter will have uh, will uh, able us 
to uh, measure it non-invasively. Uh, we have the conventional pulse oximeter, will, which will be talked in the second part, which is the uh, first and second generation. And we have also the pulse co-oximeter, uh, which is the third generation, which is in reality uh, more uh, uh, a, a real replacement of the lab oximeter where we can measure all the type of hemoglobins like the metahemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, which was unavailable in the second and the first uh, generation or what's known as a conventional pulse oximeter.